Hello, and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. In these weekly video casts, we go over the latest and sometimes greatest of SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 research with a special focus on data science and bioinformatics. This is for fans everywhere, whether you are an expert in these fields or are just excited about what computers can do to help solve medicine. We try to create a snapshot with each one of these weekly episodes of what's happening right now. What's the most exciting research in our perspective of what's coming down the pike. It's not meant to be a comprehensive review. And so there's lots of papers out there coming out. We don't pretend to read all of them and report on them all. We just highlight the ones we think are especially innovative and open up new avenues for us all to work on new research projects. Let's get started with a review of vaccines and where we're at today. Now this isn't original research, which is what we normally would highlight, but because vaccine development is so important, I thought it was an interesting study to include. SARS-CoV-2 vaccine status report by Aminat Adam Kramer, published in Immunity on April 14th, 2020. The goal here was to review and examine a timeline for development of a new vaccine for this virus. The method was their own expert perspective, combined with a review of the literature and current clinical trials. What they found and report on is that uh, when we know are there are no coronavirus vaccines available of any kind, not, for this, not just for this virus, that there were some in development for SARS-CoV-1 that made it to the first phase of clinical trials, but then were abandoned, and that companies are using really exciting technology to develop these new vaccines, but in some cases these technologies are unvalidated and may take some time to come up to scale. And of course, they note that it's extremely important that these vaccines are studied for their safety and efficacy in animal trials before they even enter humans, or of course, make it to our doctor's offices. The conclusion here and by them, and I agree, is that more investment is needed to support our vaccine development infrastructure so that we can respond more quickly in the future when these types of pandemics might come up. They have a great graphic of not only the virus that you can see here on the left and the important spike protein where most of the vaccines are targeted at, but the different types of vaccines and their development from new, new style RNA and DNA based vaccines to kind of the more traditional vaccines that we know. They also have this beautiful graphic on the right about the time frame to build a new vaccine basically from scratch. It is sometimes um, up to 18 months or longer, and you can see the many different processes that these vaccines will have to go through. And that phase, these clinical trials, phase one, two, and three, are not going to be the end of the, kind of the vaccine story. Next, we're gonna talk about a really cool study that was pretty dense to get through, but makes a lot of data available. And so I think a lot of our bioinformatics and data scientists uh, among us are gonna love this study for, for the data that it provides. The Architecture of SARS-CoV-2 Transcriptome by Kim et al, published in Cell and still in press, so date has not been released. The full manuscript is available and you can read it and the uh, link is given on the slide. The goal of this study was to elucidate the SARS-CoV-2 transcriptome. The transcriptome is basically the collection of genes that are currently active in a cell. Cells can do a lot of different things. The genes that are active inside the cell guide and tell us what a cell is doing. And so the transcriptome is the name for the genes that are active inside of a cell. The method they used were two different sequencing technologies, which is really cool. One short read high fidelity method, and this one is that, um, this is what gave us most of our genome data to date. And one longer read, but with a higher error rate, which makes it a little bit easier to analyze in a lot of cases, it allows you to do some more sophisticated analyses, but often it comes with that higher error rate. Also, it can directly sequence RNA, which is a really cool feature that I actually didn't know about before this. One of the results they found was that 65% of infected cells, uh, the RNA in these infected cells, was actually from the virus. So the virus is not only expressing, getting the cell to express its genome, but it's down-regulating and suppressing the human genome at the same time. There's also tons of interesting RNA modifications that they don't really know exactly what they do, but they seem like they're probably involved with regulation, gene regulation, maybe suppressing the human cell function that I was talking about. And there's lots of unexpected other types of splicing events that could have important functional um, components, but we really don't know what they do yet. The conclusion, my conclusion from here is that this is a really rich but really dense paper uh, that makes a new data set publicly available. And so I want to make sure everyone had links to that and could access it. 
I really love this figure because it was showing the entire genome and it also showed where each of the proteins are. They map back to the viral genome. These are results. These are kind of the high level results of identifying where um, these RNA transcripts that they sequenced were coming from. You can see this is where they got the 65 to 68% of the RNA that they were sequencing was due to the virus and not the host. Um, and they were able to find, this is how they were able to find the differences, the modifications from the viral genome. IVT is the virus in a dish, in vitro transcriptome. And so they compared the in vitro in a dish versus what they saw in a cell. And they see that the cell has modifications that the virus in the dish doesn't have. So that means they're co-opting the human cell machinery to make modifications of these RNAs um, that probably have in interesting and important functional consequences that we have yet to determine. I thought this figure was really cool for showing that. This is the link to the data itself. I encourage you to go check it out and post about it and let us know if you're able to do some analyses with these. The last study I wanted to talk about is about contact tracing. So we've all seen in the news recently that Apple and Google have really have teamed up to implement APIs for their software, for their mobile phone software. Um, operating systems to allow for contact tracing. And we've seen the New York Times articles, but just uh, in the last couple of days, Apple and Google released the first draft of their API. And I just think it's amazing to see this document. And the most striking thing is that Apple and Google's logos are right there next to each other. Um, and I read through it. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at it too. So the study I want to highlight is quantifying SARS-CoV-2 transmission suggests epidemic control with digital contact tracing. Ferretti et al. Science, March 31st, 31st, 2020. So the goal of this study was to evaluate the potential efficacy of digital contact tracing and mitigating the spread of this novel coronavirus. What they did is they built a mathematical model. They thought really deeply about how to accurately assess what the parameters of that model will be from real world data, and to put realistic confidence intervals, uncertainty around those parameters so that they could explore a wide range of possibilities. They conclude in their study that manual contact tracing is simply not fast enough to control this pandemic, and we need something that can be um, much quicker than that or perhaps instantaneous. They argue that an app can be this instantaneous solution, and they provide a framework for how we would implement such a thing. And it happens to look a lot like what Apple and Google are describing in their, in their API. Conclusion is that, my conclusion is that a next generation virus needs a next generation solution in order to keep it at bay. This figure I really liked, not only because it shows different transmission rates that they were careful to estimate by, um, by the different modes, um, but also kind of lists them out. And so I'm gonna talk about them because I know there's been some questions around kind of what these all mean. So asymptomatic transmission is transmission or being infected from somebody who's never shown symptoms and never will develop symptoms. And they estimate that the transmission rate for this group is the lowest of the four. Environmental transmission is kind of the cough on the doorknob. You know, and there's some contamination in the environment. You grab that contamination, you touch your face, and then you get infected that way. Symptomatic transmission is transmission from direct contact with a symptomatic individual. And then pre-symptomatic transmission is um, transmission or infection from an indirect contact with an individual who is going to show symptoms, they just aren't showing symptoms yet. And you can see that they are estimating the rate is highest in this group. Of course, there are confidence intervals on these and they overlap, um, but they're mostly using these again for their modeling. This is the proposed structure that they are talking about when they're talking about digital contact tracing and immediate uh, contact tracing. So the model here is that you might have this individual A who goes through their normal work day and they encounter many people on the way, they ride the train to work, they're at work working with people and then come back home. The next day this individual wakes up and is feeling a little sick, has a high fever maybe, and requests a, reports that and requests a test. As soon as that test comes back positive, they also report that. Then instantly, everyone who they were in contact with through the magic of the Google and Apple API will be notified that they either need to self-isolate um, for 14 days or they should practice social distancing because they're at, in a higher risk category. 
And then they also talk about different procedures that institutions, workplaces, and governments could take to clean um, and sterilize surfaces and um, environments for us. This is the most striking figure and the most important figure from this study. So on the y-axis here is the success rate at quarantining contacts. And this is really just how many people are participating. So how many users of the app, how many iPhone and Android users, our smartphone users do we have in the country? Um, so that could be driven pretty high. The other axis, the x-axis, is the percent success in isolating cases. So that is how effective is a notification that you should self-isolate? Um, are you following that? And I think the most important thing they find here is on the left, there's two most important things. On the left is that no amount of manual contact tracing, even if we all did it 100%, um, it's still not gonna be quite enough to bring down um, and fight the pandemic. But if we do instantaneous contact tracing, it makes a huge difference. And in fact, not everyone has to self-isolate. So if people are missed their notifications, if they just can't for some reason, or they don't have a smartphone, these are not going to destroy this method. It can still work even when not everyone is participating. Could be a way that we can all get back to work. I want to highlight this project that I just came across today. I actually signed up for it. I think it could be a really cool um, new data set that we can analyze. It's made available by C3AI. Um, it's collecting a lot of data together. I've yet to see what the structure of that data will be. Hopefully, they are working on the interoperability between these data sets so that data scientists and bioinformaticists everywhere can easily start to work on it, hack on it, and produce interesting results. So I'll have to stay tuned for that. You can go, and I encourage you to go sign up for their release, which should be soon. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and um, especially thank my executive producer, Scott McGrath, and everyone who's helped review these papers and submitted papers for us to review. Thanks and see you next time. <laughs>